So hi, Andrew. Thanks so much for joining me and giving me a bit of your time. Yeah, great to be with you. Yeah, really nice to see you. And I think the last time I saw you was on a leadership training about a year ago, maybe, or something like that. Yeah, that sounds right. We've, we've actually got our equivalent block coming up this weekend. So I'm going to be teaching on Zoom all day Friday and all day Saturday. Lucky so, you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, lucky <laughs> them, I think it's probably more to yeah. the point. <laughs> you on a screen for two days. It sounds sounds like my ideal weekend, yeah, to be what, honest. What, <laughs> <laughs> what subjects are you doing with them? I'm doing, you remember we did a module on, on Acts, Paul and James, like we do a biblical theology in 12 days. And um, this is days 10 and 11 or 12 on that. So, yeah, it's good. Oh. It's good stuff. I, I look forward to it, but it's going to be a strange doing it on Zoom. Mm, yeah i'm pleased you're still doing it because uh i'm part we're part of regions beyond and they've um just frozen their school frozen our school for several months we've been fortunate i managed to get uh, so the think conference is going to go ahead the catalyst course goes ahead i've actually just now literally 10 minutes ago got confirmation from a of a special guest we're able to get from another country who we'd never get to come and speak on this course who was able to zoom in for us for an hour so it, it's creating opportunities as well as taking away, isn't it? So we're, we're quite blessed. It's, it's worked to our advantage so far. So yeah. Good. Hence me doing this with you. I think I'd be lucky. <laughs> I would not even to, noticed. But <laughs> <laughs> I'd be lucky to pin self now usually, weird. but that's it. Yeah. So if, um, some people in Redeemer and um, the church that we've just started in Worthing, you may not know about that actually, um, but won't know you, won't have met you, won't have seen you. So I wonder if you could just tell them just a tiny bit about yourself, like what you do uh, day to day. Yeah. Um, so I'm Andrew. I'm married to Rachel. We have three kids who are 11, 9 and 4. I am the teaching pastor at King's Church London, um, which basically means that I do lots of the preaching there, but I also run quite a lot of training and theological sort of conferences and write books and academic stuff from time to time um so i have a sort of about half my job is local church teaching pastor and half my job is trans local stuff that's intended to serve the wider church and that involves depending on whether there's a lockdown on either a lot of writing or a lot of traveling or a bit of both or uh, that that sort of thing so it's, it's really trying to trying to serve evangelical and charismatic evangelical christianity with about half my time and then the other half is more being a local church teaching pastor. So I keep That's busy. Great. But, yeah, uh, very, I'm sure you're very busy. Good. And your role must have changed quite a bit during this time. Like in terms it's of weird. The it's, wider it, I mean, everyone's has, but it is odd. I think what the, the benefit I have of doing what I do is that the, the sort of longer term, we've got a lot of, you know, in this new zoom world, people a lot of the short-term stuff you're doing can't be done so people get reallocated to do long-term projects and some people's jobs lend themselves very well to that and some don't i'm just fortunate that mine does because you're doing writing projects which you know you're writing basically i've written most of a book while i've been on lockdown and that's not something that most people can just yeah. switch on in their job but it's quite a help, helpful outlet because mm. um, otherwise not only do you not have that much to do you also get quite bored mm. um if you're not able to function properly so yeah i've been i've been it has it's morphed but it hasn't disappeared and obviously you're still you're still preaching regularly mm. in the church you're just doing it in a different way it's weird yeah yeah so are you is it going to break any rules if i ask you to give us a, a sneak preview of your new book oh well no it's not going to break any rules at all although it's funny the book i'm writing is not my new book um oh okay it, books the lead time on books particularly when you publish them in america which i typically do now is is much longer than you'd think as in you think you finish a book and then it comes out whereas what actually happens is you finish writing a book you know you spend sort of six nine twelve months writing a book and then it then starts the sort of 12 to 18 month process of review and pre-publicity and editing and copy editing and <laughs> during which time you're probably writing your project after right, that. okay so i have been working on a popular level commentary on one corinthians which oh, will just fantastic. be called one corinthians for you in the good books that in the good book company series that's the book i've been writing in lockdown but that's not the next book i have coming out the next book i have coming out which i got the cover proofs for today which is very cool uh, is called God of All Things, and it's a book which is effectively a biblical theology of created things. It takes 30 created things like bread and rain and water and pigs and bee honey and things like that and 
does theology through those objects and says this is what we can learn about god to worship and to feel worship and to delight in him through created stuff oh, so that's fantastic. the next thing i've got coming out the corinthians thing will be on the other side of that so. right okay so when's the god in all things when can we february i believe i think i've got to, i actually was given a date recently february around valentine's day i think from memory right um next year fantastic so, and Corinthians another year or something after that. Maybe. I imagine, yeah, because then you have these more weird weirdnesses about, you know, you can't publish this within a year of publishing that and all that. I understand why it's there, but so yeah, it's a strange, the lead times on these things are longer than you probably think. Mm. I'm hoping we're going to um, actually teach through 1 Corinthians in the, from the autumn, but I guess you're, oh, okay. I'm going to be a year ahead of your beautiful new commentary so i'm gonna we're gonna go through you probably it. would but you and i know each other so you'll probably if it would be helpful at all you'll probably get a sneak peek but it's um it's it's a it's an amazing book to teach through you're gonna do it in september i hope so yeah um and maybe go through to we'll probably take a little while doing it maybe in like a couple of chunks yeah it's such a great book it's, we, it's is what the church in eastbourne that i used to be a pastor at was going to do until lockdown hit we now mm-hmm. felt like well, that's not quite gonna work but it's the first book I ever preached through when I started being a pastor. So um, I think, I just think it's gold, absolute gold dust. So mm. contemporary. So yeah. it feels like it's speaking into our world yeah. more than any of Paul's letters do to me. I, I think it's, you know, it's not, it's not about, it's not about circumcision and table fellowship. It's about sex and divisions in leadership and spiritual mm. gifts. And they're like things that churches today are all wrestling with. So it's yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the reasons I wanted to go through it. I thought it would cover some really helpful kind of foundations early on in a new church of the cross, the resurrection, but also cover some really kind of gritty cultural issues. So here you go, I'm working through it at the moment. So complete tangent. So in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul yeah. talks about um, the, 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 the present form of this world passing away in verse 30 something, I think. And but before that, he says, those who are married live as if they're not. Those who are doing business as if they're not. What am I supposed to do with that? So I'm married. So what does it mean for me to be a married man and live as if I'm not married? Because the world is the former, the current world is passing away. What do I do with that? I I think it's a Paul. It's a it's very similar to what Jesus says when he says you you anybody who loves his father or mother or wife or brother or sister more than me is not worthy of me i think paul it's a similar way of a similar point they're trying to get to but they both use different language and idioms for it i think paul is saying uh paul is very explicitly through an eschatological lens he's saying that we're gonna we're gonna very soon hit the buffers of the return of christ and so let's make sure that we live mindful of that fact and not cling on to anything so Mm. closely that it stops us from being fruitful for god um, but I don't think you should. O- we also shouldn't overread it and therefore say, therefore, I'm going to act, act as if my wife's not real or act as if I don't have any obligations to her. Because in that very chapter, of course, he said the fact that I'm a single man in Paul's case means that I don't have some of the troubles that those who are married have in this world because they have to be mindful of the needs of their wife or their husband and their children. And so I think we've got to read the text you just mentioned in tension, in a cor- correct tension with what he mm. says earlier in the chapter. And so therefore, Paul clearly does believe that husbands have obligations to their wife. That means they are not going to be able to do various gospel ministry things that Paul himself can do because he's single. Mm. I think it's less saying act as if your wife wasn't there and you didn't have a commitment and more saying if you if your heart is bound up in the things of this world, you're going to be sorely disappointed if your treasure or your prize or the kingdom for you Mm. is rooted in earthly things. Mm. You're going to find, as he says in chapter 13, one day they're just going to pass away. Mm. and you're going to be face to face with christ and at that point those things are not going to matter so i think that's the that's the best way to read it in Mm. in harmony with various other elements in the text Mm. and just thinking like as we're starting this new church um i mean i know very little about ancient corinth but just the idea that there are all these temples and yet paul sees what he's done as starting this like temple of temples like the the true temple to the one true god in the midst of a, a world of temples and just wanting this people to be almost like they're from another world, like you're saying, this, the, the return of Jesus is going to happen really soon. And actually, we're like this this community of the new world that's been plopped into this current one because of the resurrection mm. of Jesus and the giving of the Spirit. So if we're so we're starting this or have started this new church, what would you say were some key, I guess, theological things that we should be making sure are right 
in the center of things early on like if you if you were to come to our church if you were Paul and you started this church and you came back I don't know a year later or something what would you be pleased that was there as like a key (laughs) final feature or what would you be not pleased that wasn't there you know if there was something that was obviously missing what would kind of um, grate against you that wasn't there wow it's a big question, isn't it? What, what are all the things that churches should and should not do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you could just cover that for That's me in five minutes. Really 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 help. I think it might, I would probably think about this from an inside out perspective or, I mean, Paul himself, obviously in 1 Corinthians talks about foundation and then building and building and building. And I think I might, you know, use a similar image really where you get what's the very center. Um, I think the center of Christian faith is, if you like, is God, is the Trinity, is Father, Son and Spirit. And then you work out from there and you, very quickly get into all of the other doctrines covered by the creed and i think probably when starting a church the emphasis on all the things that christians all believe the the most the most foundational truths which i think the nicene creed is a great summary of but i think that kind of idea again one corinthians does that for you that's the great thing about it christ crucified here's the gospel i preached to you christ died for our sins he rose all those if mm. essential gospel truths i think from there paul says I'm just using Corinthians here, but I think this is yeah, a good yeah. way to do it. Yeah. One Corinthians three then says, no one can lay any other foundation other than that. What I, which I laid, which is Jesus Christ. And now other people are building on it. And so I think it's appropriate to build. He's annoyed that they're building badly, but then the things you build on it very quickly are things like, what is the nature of the people of God, the unity and diversity of the people of God, the fact that the church is again, in Paul's language is a field is God's building is God's temple is the body of Christ. Again, Corinthians is brilliant for this because they're all in there. And I think, the, the identity and purpose of the church, which is connected both to your ecclesiology, who we are as the people of God, and your missiology, what we are here for to do, as well as your eschatology, where the story is going to end. And I think in a way, in saying that, you're basically covering off the, still the creed. The creed is basically, I believe in God and Jesus mm. in the spirit. And then in the church, baptism, etc., and in the age to come, eschatology. And I think those themes together that's those are the big things but when paul gets really angry with a church for doing something wrong it's usually because one of those things have been bungled or maybe all of them yeah and when paul comes back and says i'm so pleased you're walking in the truth he's generally saying you guys have got those things right he will talk probably about one of those five central ideas and then it's just a question of how you you know package them and keep returning to them and i think Obviously, that doesn't mean that every message has, you know, preaching wise has to be on all of those things. Mm. Um, as you, as you know, one Corinthians, lots of it is about very contemporary themes about the way the, the world interacts with the culture. But you're always drawing your the grammar of your response to the world from those kinds of themes. That even when we're talking about sex, we're really talking about how God has made human beings to function, and you're yeah. really talking about what Jesus has done in His death and how the Spirit transforms us into his likeness and where male male and female are headed in the end and what the church is for and how it relates to the world so i think those are the those are the kind of primary biblical teachings through which all the other stuff we talk about gets filtered i suppose Mm. that's really helpful so just thinking about your role at king's how are you do you think this through in that way like how are you make ensuring that over say the course of a year or a couple of years that you're covering these key things that you're not you're you're not really you know kind of skewing in one direction at the detriment of the other yeah i mean i the thing is i think we probably always do you do skew in a direction uh in in depending on how short your time frame is so i think in any given month we will not have a our diet will not be that balanced i suspect Mm. um i think in a year your balance should be reasonably good and I think you do that by running, in at least in our context, multiple preaching series. There's probably three big ones and three small ones. Um, so you, we use the, we generally think in terms. And so, you know, autumn term, spring term, summer term, and those will be different types of series. I mm. often use the language of up, in, out, uh, the sort of Mike Breen terminology, which helps me. So there's going to be a series which is very much devotional, doxological, probably heavier on scriptural interpretation. A series which is going to be much more about in, about the community, about what the church is, about how we are to function, which will be much more round about how we can build church. And then a series which is much more out, which is trying to engage with questions raised in the world and make sure we're answering those well and or talk about our mission to serve the world. And those will be the three big series. 
and that gives us a balance and then when you stand back again for preaching across a five-year period or something you're also trying to get balance with the whole council of scripture you know trying mm. to make sure that you've covered you know we've just done some psalms we're going to do some wisdom we've just did a gospel before that we were doing a letter last year we did revelation then we're going to do you know old mm. testament prophets so you're just trying to keep them the kind of text you're reading changing as well but I think if you do any of those kinds of writings properly, you're going to be returning again and again to the themes I just mentioned. You're going to be drawing Christian theology from the text. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not sure any one message is balanced. I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's supposed to be. I th- I'd, I'd become incredibly bland if I felt like I had to say everything in every message. But as you get a, wide, a longer period of time, your messages do become more balanced and you get a more rounded. You see, 1 Corinthians isn't a balanced letter. Mm. to take a good example and neither any of the others if it wasn't for one corinthians we wouldn't even know that paul's churches took communion Mm. like that's the only text in which mentioned but and we wouldn't probably know that they spoke in tongues either or if you see what i mean yeah yeah. paul doesn't write in that sense balanced letters but the balance of his corpus together is intended to lead the churches into all the truth and and the whole Mm. council of god and i think that's that's the way we preach too Mm. so Sticking with the theme of 1 Corinthians then, seeing as we've kind of stuck with that, what would you, Paul obviously, when he was writing, he's got his theological challenges. He's got the things that he's seeing in the church or maybe things that he's seeing in the culture that are kind of coming into the church or, uh, or a whole mixture of things like that. What do you think, what's been your observation on what are some like maybe what the key theological challenge that you see churches grappling with at the moment, particularly churches that you work with? What, what do you think is the thing that we're struggling with, that we're hitting against? Ah, that's good. I think that the issue that, you're, that man, is manifesting itself in the church, you know that phrase, the issue is never the issue. Mm, the thing yep. that you see as presenting itself is usually not the thing that's actually the problem. Mm. I think the issue that is in our, not just our generation, but in some ways for the last 250 years, uh, the church has been wrestling with issues of something like the authority of scripture like who who ultimately does god get to speak and we and we submit to him Mm. or do we form our own basis for critiquing do we stand under the bible or do we stand over the bible as its judges or as its recipients you know and i Mm. think that to be honest i feel when i first started blogging i wrote a piece saying this is the biggest theological debate of the next 20 years and i still think that really because that's often what's going on under the surface but that's very rarely the issue that people come into the church saying this is my problem they, mm. some people do some people are clear that that is their issue but much of the time as a as a pastor or as a people in the church or even people outside the church they're just saying i'm not sure if i quite believe this mm. and but but that might not be what they're saying that's the framework they've received from the world they're in or their parents or their school or whatever and therefore the presenting issue might be a very obvious thing like again one corinthians territory sex and sexuality that would be an obvious area where they're clashing on but that actually isn't that isn't what people would have said 25 years ago when in fact it wasn't even when i first did started being a pastor when i first taught you 15 mm. years ago on impact or whatever i don't think the issue i don't think we would even have done any training on sexual mm. ethics and we probably should have we might not have but I, maybe a pete carter or someone might have covered it a little bit in one of his sessions yeah yeah it was a very small part speaking to 20 year olds because it wasn't people's primary question and in the last 15 years it's become almost the only question that people age 21 are asked but that's not because it's suddenly come out of nowhere as an an issue and people are going brand new topic It's because the foundation of is god god or am i Mm. is ultimately tussling under the surface and whatever the culture is then speaking into you confront mm. scripture at whatever the point is that they're challenging it mm. um and uh i just read a, if i can share this briefly but i just mm. read there, there's a brilliant article about this about you know do you know the story about oh, i'm now going to get which band it was wrong was it led zeppelin or was it somebody like that who said who's the band that said we are only going to have we're only going to play the gig if you have only blue m&ms in our goodness i'm not idea green room i can't remember what the band was anyway hopefully a fam- led a zeppelin so i love led famous, zeppelin so could have been i know it could have been alice cooper it could have, i can't but anyway i it's someone you've you've heard of a band did this and they said we're only gonna play the gig if you've got only blue m&ms in our in our room and i'd always heard that story and thought it was fictional but it turns out it was true and the reason why they did it they put it in their terms and conditions because they kept turning up to gigs and finding that the entire gig 
basically the spec they'd sent hadn't been honored. They said, we play very loud music. And if we don't have the right kit, it's not going to, it's going to blow the speakers or we just simply won't sound any good. So they would put their terms and conditions to be very detailed about all their spec. And they found people kept ignoring it. So they put in this clause about only blue M&Ms in their green room. And so then when they would literally walk up to a venue and they'd find blue M&Ms in their thing, and they'd say, these guys read our terms and conditions properly. This is going to be fine. Or they didn't read the terms and conditions. We're out of here. And they didn't even try to play the gig because they knew it wasn't going to work. And it's like the, the blue M&Ms almost like a, a fuse or a trip switch for the entire system. And I think in any generation, mm. the cultural pressure point is the blue M&Ms. At the moment, it's sex and sexuality. 15 years ago, it wasn't. In 30 years, it'll be something else. But mm. that's not the primary issue in Christian thinking. It just happens to be the issue that trips the switch of, oh, I don't like what the Bible is saying. I don't like what God says because I want to be in charge. And so I think what's ultimately going on is the battle that's been going on since the garden of, did God really say? Mm. But yeah. I think it's exp what you'll see at the moment might be sex and sexuality, but that's not because that's the key issue really mm. It's because that just happens to be the issue where culture is pressing and the church is at risk of backing off. So I, yeah, it depends which way. And obviously again, one Corinthians speaks to both of those issues. It talks about a lot about sex, but it also talks a lot about the need not to go beyond what is written. Mm. and the need to stand in that sense under the authority of you know i'm speaking to you if anyone wants to ignore me i'm the, you should know this is the command of the lord and if you ignore it you're going to be ignored yourself so the it's a brilliant letter through which to explore these things because both of those issues are, are clearly in play in it mm. yeah no it's really helpful so go on give me your golden bullet your like your i don't know your one minute answer to how do you instill a high value or a high value of god that sounds a ridiculous thing so isn't it but how, how do you how do you ensure that i guess a high value of scripture is in the foundation of the church that you're actually helping train people to think to have a different worldview really about where they're set of or where their authority lies yeah i i to me the only way that works long term is to show that jesus had that attitude so I, in, in that I think we have to derive our authority. You've probably heard me say this again when you were 20 on this course. <laughs> I, you I derive our authority of scripture from the authority of Jesus and not the other way around. That is, I don't say Jesus is God because the Bible says so, although I, of course that's true. Mm. I ultimately, I say the Bible's authority matters because I believe Jesus is Lord. Mm. And actually because that, it, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus and his embodiment of what God is like means that whatever he says matters to me far more than anything else because I'm a worshiper and a follower of Jesus. And so when he displays an attitude like towards scripture, as he does in his battle with the serpent in with Satan in Matthew four or Luke four, or in any number of dozens and dozens of things mm. he says about the Bible. If I catch that spirit with respect to scripture, I will find myself also yielding to the word of God, even when I don't necessarily like or find easy what it says. Mm. And I think if I try and go about it any other way, like rationalist apologetics defending every problem in the Bible or, you know, systematic theology explaining why this must be the way God's revealed himself, I think ultimately those things can support but can't sustain the argument on its own. I think I have to go to the way Jesus handled and submitted and yielded to what God had spoken in Scripture. Mm. And only as I do that will I, I think, help a church see this is the most wonderful thing. You know, if Jesus is able to go to the cross because he says, put your sword away how else are the scriptures going to get fulfilled mm. like i need to follow through on what the scripture says mm. and if i don't then what is the point of what all that i've been doing and teaching here but that that's my responsibility if we can get our ourselves and our people to see the power of the word like that mm. i think the things that it says that make us uncomfortable in Jesus' day, they weren't really about sex at all. The Jewish people Jesus was teaching had no problem with what the yeah. Bible said about sex, really, except that except they probably thought that maybe on divorce or maybe they didn't realize how hypocritical they were being, but they didn't mm. they weren't worried about, you know, what the Bible says about gay sex. They were worried about all kinds of other things the Bible said. But if you can get people to see this is the word of God and God speaks with authority as you read it and speak it, um, then the challenging things it says to us become challenges I have to work through rather than reasons to dismiss it. Mm. Yeah. And I love your little book on that. Is it unbreakable? Um, yeah. Well, that's, um, that's basically, yeah, that's basically the summary of the book I wrote was to try and help people see this is really coming from what Jesus said. Yeah. That's how we're going to get our theology of scripture. Mm. 
And just that one little verse where G, I think it's in John 10, maybe where Jesus says scripture cannot be broken. Mm. I think that's such a powerful line. So I think you've got to yeah. go. Um, and we've kind of done our time, yeah, but just, just to give us the, if you think people should be reading one book at the moment, that's, you know, not the, the thousand page commentary that you're currently looking at on one Corinthians to get to grips with a Greek word, but something that most people can engage with. What have you read in the last like few months or six months that you just think was gold dust and will help people in some way, particularly maybe even at this moment? Hmm. Ooh. Or give us a top um, few. It doesn't have to be one. Well, it, so I use a chili a chili system, right? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> to, so the two chilies. I, I won't give any three chilies books. I mean, by that, that's like incredibly spicy, like academic level. But a a demanding ish, but incredibly worthwhile book, which I read I've read in the last month, um, is called by Jamie Smith. Is called On the Road with Saint Augustine. Have you read it? I haven't. It, no, but I've heard of it. It is a it's a magnificent book about Augustine uh, who was an African church father in the fifth, fourth and fifth centuries and his spiritual pilgrimage He's basically his leaving his home and trying to find fulfillment and life in all kind, all the ways that we do sex, fame, education, power, ambition, all those things. And then eventually finding they don't deliver and finding it in God. And it is, it's a book about the, our, it's a book about, Augustine and it's a book about the way that we as human beings go on the road, like the prodigal son. Mm. We leave home, we go, I'm going to go and find myself. And then what we find and what are we actually looking for when we are trying to find it and how we ultimately find ourselves settling back to finding rest in God. I think that is, now that's not a kind of necessarily like, a, it's not the easiest read and it isn't a book, it's not a book I'd give mostly to a new believer. Mm. Um, so that's two chilies. What's the best one chili book I've read in the last few months? I am about to start reading one, but I don't, I wouldn't want to plug a book I haven't read yet. I know probably in the last little while, I don't have a, oh, this is a really great kind of basic okay. level book that I would, I would think I would think to read. Um, but that may just be because I haven't been reading enough of them. So on um, the road with St. Augustine, is that what it's called? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you're just asking recently, if you're asking like, it doesn't have to have been written recently, a blinding book that I was asked when someone said to me, what's your book of the decade? a few months ago for the gospel coalition i said mike reeves's book the good god I, mm. I i thought for hours about it but i thought my this this is a book about the about god mm. and about the trinity and it's just brilliant it's so readable it's so simple it's called the good god by mike reeves and if i had if i was allowed a one chili book from any time in the last 10 years i'd choose that right okay um, so the good god i just michael don't reeves. think I'm, yeah the good god by michael reeves i haven't read any one chili books recently enough uh, to add to that in the last few months but yeah, that's give me something to think about. And just for me, the best commentary I should read on one Corinthians, apart from yours. <laughs> <laughs> I I would uh, either Anthony, have a look at either Anthony Thistleton's big, huge one, which is still the standard big reference work, but I think more readable and shorter, but still pretty chunky, is the one by uh, Brian Rosner and Roy Kiampo of in the Pillar New Testament commentary series. I think it's right. fantastic. It was published in 2010. I think that's probably a slightly easier one to work through. It is easier than Fizzleton. It's brilliant. Um, so I, if I, but if I only had one and I was going to buy one, I would still buy Fizzleton because it is the, the Uber compendium one. It's right. Just not okay. as readable and not as well put together. I don't think as the Camper and Rosner one. Andrew, thanks so much for your time. Really. It's been a pleasure. It. It's been nice to see you and I will yeah. head straight off, but um, yeah. yeah, great to see you. Yeah, have a great week. All right. See ya. Bye.